Monica, thank you very much for joining us uh, this afternoon as part of our Freedom From uh, Worry series. And a uh, warm welcome to all our attendees uh, who are here with us. Uh, uh, this is a series of uh, conversations we are having with uh, subject matter experts uh, on uh, what they think about uh, money, what they think about uh, worrying about money uh, in this uh, in our Independence Month. Uh, so Monica doesn't require any introductions. Uh, she's one of the most well-known personalities uh, in India, in personal finance uh, and in media. Uh, just uh, as she's a double MA uh, from Delhi School of Economics and University of Wales, uh, has been a leading uh, participant in many committees uh, around uh, making personal finance better for the country. Uh, I remember meeting Monica when we were starting Stripbox. Uh, so I'll just give a small anecdote and I'll bore you. Uh, when we were starting Stripbox, I said, okay, let me go talk to the expert. And uh, the warmth with which she uh, welcomed us and said, uh, talked about ethics, uh, talked about uh, simplicity, talked about transparency, uh, talked about professionalism uh, in, in the category in the industry, uh, which obviously encouraged us to do the right thing. Uh, so yeah, without further much ado, I'll hand over to uh, Monica. Monica, uh, so today let's start with uh, telling us a little bit about what the last four months have been like for you. Any new hobbies, uh, anything you've learned, anything you started doing you're not doing before? So tell us a little bit about the last four months. Anything you want to start? Thank you so much, Atul. Thank you for inviting me. And I do remember the early days when fintech was just starting. And, uh, you know, I've been part of this uh, transformation of, especially the mutual fund industry for a very, very long time at the regulatory and policy level. And uh, when, uh, you know, people like Scriptbox or Funds India in that time would come with their new business ideas, it was sort of uh, manifesting the policy thought that some of us had to say that if you can get the product structure right, yeah. if you can create a market, then you will have entrepreneurs coming in with businesses and the upgrade in services and quality would happen. So, uh, so this was a policy thought, which is why when actually we saw businesses coming Part of the warmth was probably just that, that, you know, this policy thought is not wrong because we were told every step of the way that the way that it works is only high commissions. Indian investors are not very intelligent. They are just return seeking. So the entire narrative was extremely negative because it was driven largely by that, uh, you know, insurance experience. So to shift that thought was very difficult because it was always that this will never work in India. It doesn't work like that. But on first principles, you know, the, the group which was working on this at policy was thinking, why will it not work? Finance is about incentives. And if you place incentives in the right place, why will the market participants not do the right thing? I mean, they're going to follow their incentive, which they should. So if you place incentives in the wrong place, why are we blaming market participants? It's a regulatory flaw. I mean, I have always said that you cannot blame market participants if you have a broken regulatory system. So this is really the run up to seeing this manifest actually on the ground. And then, you know, it's just grown by leaps and bounds. So it's delightful the way that uh, the intermediation, the advice has grown in the mutual fund space. And I think Scriptbox as a unique place of funds in a box where uh, you, you've taken away this whole choice problem from the investor. And some people like that, therefore they come there. Some people want to do their own or, you know, so with the, according to me, this is what market is about, that there's enough choice and people are able to choose what they want. If the disclosures are meaningful, if there's transparency, if advisors can be held to account, so all of those first principles actually work on the ground. So uh, I'm delighted to be here, absolutely. And your question was, what was the four months like? Actually, just one or two weeks was very uh, unsettling. It seemed like the whole world had died. And But then I think it's the human spirit. You just get used to what you have. And, uh, you know, work just kind of morphed into working from home. So and, it's been fine, absolutely. I mean, I'm quite all right. It's been good. Oh, lovely to hear that. Lovely. And, and any new hobbies? Anything? Any, any new found interest in this time? You know, it's just that it's just more work when you're at home. Also, 
household help initially was not there. So you, you know, everybody's scrambling around to do a whole lot of household work, which nobody now is used to. So that took a lot of time, but I think, uh, so no new hobby, but deeper reading, let's say, just a little deeper reading, uh, which takes a little bit of time to read and assimilate and then read more. Just that. Thanks, and, thanks. And to, to the audience, if you have any questions, please type them out in the Q&A and I'll, uh, I'll ask Monica those in due course. There are some questions we already collected. So one question which obviously is top of mind is over your years of experience, uh, what kind of behavior have you seen or uh, what do people worry about, right? Uh, you have this lovely book called Let's Talk Money, which simplifies the whole concept. But typically, what have you seen uh, which causes worry? And uh, at Scriptbox, we believe it shouldn't cause worry. Trust the advisor, trust the people who know, uh, and trust the process. But we would love to hear from you about uh, what have you heard about, what have you heard from people about worry? I think people worry about not uh, doing enough. They worry about getting left behind. They worry about missing an opportunity. They worry about uh, how others seem to get the deals, which they don't seem to get. They worry about being the unluckiest investor. They worry about uh, not, you know, they worry about their fixed deposits giving too little. They worry about the money in the market because they've taken a punt. It's not thought through. Uh, they will get into real estate deals because their neighbor has got a good return. Then they'll worry about the whole process of real estate. So a lot of the worry is because people don't, they don't think it through before they start investing. And they, they take a piecemeal approach and they take a, a binary approach. It's this versus that. They don't look at this uh, money decision as an ongoing series of events for your entire life. Like this is that oil which runs through your entire life. And we always tend to think that I'll do this now, then I'll do something later. But if we could just take a holistic view, a very long term view about our money and then invest that time at the top of that decision, front load the time today, then I have seen personally how worries actually go away. So people that I know, friends, families, you know, so I've encouraged them to start working with a planner. So I can, I can talk to them, but I'm not qualified to, uh, I'm not, I don't practice commercially. That's one decision I took. That That is one thing I won't do because I will remain that person in the middle, unbiased person who doesn't get compensated in any which way. So I've encouraged friends, family, extend, you know, everybody to work with financial planners. And it's been about 10 to 12 years for some of them. And I have personally seen their transition from jumping from investment to investment. And real estate is one of the worst things that people get trapped into. And of course, insurances. But slowly, you see the behavior change where markets going up, down, you know, okay, big deal. Uh, Faridabad is opening up, Noida is opening up no way you know so that uh, that greed and fear tends to go away and that is what people mostly worry about you know the greed that i'm not getting that good deal and the fear yeah. that i'm not doing enough so leading on from that so what would your advice be to our customers uh, they sort of talked about financial planning in terms of best practices right uh, you've talked about those jam jars you've talked about types of money could you just spend some time talking about best practices for and our typical customers are either just getting started or being with us for a few years uh, and are yeah and understand finance but would love to know from you uh, what are the best practices you encourage people to do and you've learned from so the way that i have mentioned in the book that investing actually in my world comes much later and investing comes at the sixth or the seventh step it's always a good idea to get your cash flows in order so that you know how much you can save and spend so it's a very simple uh, idea. You, you're just separating out your spending money from your saving money. So that's really the first habit that I encourage people to form because then you have far greater control on what you spend and you don't ever say that I don't know where my money goes because you know exactly how much you're spending. Second is to build an emergency fund which gives you that stability. So the other thing that I learned is that we don't want to put money down for long-term investing in the equity market specifically, 
is because we think that we may need the money for an emergency. What if I needed the money? It's a genuine concern. I am not at any point talking down this concern of people. It is, and they must have this concern. But if there is a concern, there is a financial solution to it, which is an emergency fund. So between six months to two years, depending on your age, stage, situation, all of that, if you are able to put that much money away and you build your life and medical insurances, life, of course, is a pure term. You don't buy toxic products like traditional plans ever. Then your money is open for long-term investing. And I, I always say that mutual funds in India have been built for the retail market. The regulator has spent 15 years cleaning the product out of front commissions, trail commissions up fronted. We have seen so much regulatory action to get the product retail friendly. So for the retail investor who has done all this hygiene and is now ready to invest long term, it, it can be, uh, I mean, there are products which you can use for short, medium, long term, but most people come into mutual funds for the long term and that is fair enough. You get a flavor of what the product can do. That is what I advise that you you build a foundation so that your money is available for investing long term. So if a March like dip of 30% happens, you don't blink an eyelid because you had your emergency fund. You lost your job, your whole world collapsed. You stopped your SIPs, sure, but you were not really worried about your money because you had your emergency fund. So if you do the foundational work, it's only then you can enter the stock market with a very long term view. So I always give the analogy that when you learn swimming, you uh, flail around a bit in the uh, shallow end, you immediately don't jump in the deep end. So equity is the deep end. You really need to know how to swim because there's lots of problems. You don't want to do penny stocks. You don't want to do individual stocks. There's a whole way to navigate the stock market to give your money equity exposure. But for that, you need to build your foundation. And that is what I think uh, my uh, advice to everybody is that if you do the homework, if you do the background work, you're far more stable in the market. Great. Thank you very much, Monica. So, yeah, so we, we, we at Scribbox, again, encourage people to start with an emergency fund, six to nine months of expenses, and especially now. I mean, uh, though, uh, though as in, in that sense, uh, it's financially probably the least rewarding for the distributor. Uh, but the product we promote the most uh, is the emergency fund, the liquid funds equivalent. So the short range in our, there's a product called emergency fund essentially for this. Uh, now coming to uh, sort of the best practices. So people have done the discipline. Some of our customers have been with us some time. They have an emergency corpus uh, and they've been investing. But yeah, returns obviously is something people chase. And uh, we are not, I mean, the, the Franklin Tech Printer was a classic example of why not to chase returns and, and be more prudent in style. Uh, what is your advice to people? Because wo jo, that Hindi dialogue kitna deti hai, seems to be the ultimate question always. And uh, in spite of all the advice, uh, or the final question is kitna deti hai. How do we get people to behave, to understand the concept that this is long term? Uh, and wh what is your suggestions and what's been your experience? You're absolutely right. So one of the questions I used to do was TV shows and uh, a persistent question has been, I want very high return with zero risk. <laughs> so I want the moon, but I don't want to travel. You know, so there, there is this uh, expectation which is built probably on those years of government returns, which were very high, PPF, FTs, where, uh, so I was looking at some data. Uh, there was a period where the five-year FD rate, SPI was 12%, the PPF was 12 Wow. What people, again, so I think it is education because people forgot that inflation in those times was 13% and 14% in yeah. those years. So your real return was actually negative on these yeah. products. But people sort of just look at the return number in isolation to the inflation number and say that, oh, my FD is giving 12 but inflation is doing 13. So you're getting a negative return. So the first thing really is to understand what is really, what is my return? And the second thing is to understand that your higher return will always come with higher risk. 
So all the 81 bondholders of Yes Bank who migrated from fixed deposits to this uh, FD product with higher return should have asked the question, why is this bond giving a higher return? What is it about this bond which gives me a higher return? So a person seeking a real estate corporate deposit when the five-year bank rate is uh, 8% and this corporate deposit is giving you 12, should ask, what is it about this deal that this person is willing to give me 12? So, you know, that education, that interest is really a cost for delaying consumption, for the risk that I'm taking, and what is the risk the person may not give my interest back or run away with my money. So this, this insight that higher return will always come with higher risk is something which I think needs to be, we cannot say this enough. And you've taken the, it's a classic case. I mean, Templeton was never shy of saying these are high risk funds. The entire market knew these are high risk funds. Nobody was shy to call it high risk. So yes, you enjoyed the higher return when going was good, but you know, risk comes, rewards come with risk. So I think investors need to understand and manage expectations and say that, I, with my risk profile, with the amount of risk that I'm willing to take, this is the return that I can expect. Now, if you see the run up in the small caps when they are doing 40% and you want to change your risk appetite, I think, uh, you know, advisors like you should actually record people when the market cracks and people come in and say, I'm feeling afraid. You should actually record them to say, look, you fix your risk appetite today when market has cracked 30%. Now you tell me what your asset allocation is. Because when you do asset allocation decisions in a bull run, you will always overestimate your risk capacity. So maybe it's just a good idea to record people saying that I can't take risk, I want 100% safe. Because 100% safe means lower return. There True. is no other way. True. So and uh, sort of the again this is not to promote trip box but uh, we always talk to our customers being obsessive about process about asset allocation uh, about fund selection based on that asset allocation and then sticking with your plan for a long time uh, right. sort of uh, flitting around uh, your advice uh, in that regard and uh, sort of that's right asset allocation is something that i have spoken about all my life and i have written my book and i will tell you a personal story where I didn't follow my own advice because I'm overconfident. I know the market. I can take the risk. I know my long term. I am there in the equity market for perpetuity. I will only milk it when I need it. But I think COVID was an event which sort of woke me up also because, you know, all of us are getting on in age. I'm not, you know, you're not at the starting of your career. You're not even at the middle of your career. You're now moving towards the last 10 years of your career pre-retirement. And uh, no, you are in the last 10 years of your, that risk, the difference between risk capacity and risk appetite. I have a very large appetite for risk. But sure. My capacity I understood in that uh, when, uh, when the uh, Templeton froze the schemes, when the fear of a contagion was there on debt funds, on liquid funds, there was a, there was a two week, one week period in which I think I woke up and said, even a person like me needs to do asset allocation. So, because see, I am actually, my appetite is very large because I've simply done the black numbers. I know what time in the market on a small cap fund or a mid cap fund would do to my uh, CAGR, okay? I'm, I'm over invested, like I'm, I go all out because you know I, I know that Indian economy is growing. I know that if you have staying power, you will do very well if your choice of a product is well, good. But I think asset allocation is something which is like your safety net. That uh, who would have thought a COVID-like event would come? And we don't know what else happens now after this. Because it's increasingly a world which is more and more unstable. I mean, if you just look at 2020, it's a very unusual year. And we don't know if this persists. So what that asset allocation does, it just gives you a seat belt so that in case there's a very hard hit, you are protected. Mm. So I learned that lesson for myself, saying that asset allocation is paramount and it depends on your age and stage 
for your risk capacity, how much risk at your age and stage you should take as opposed to your risk appetite, which could be very, very high. So that is what I can, I want to tell all of your uh, customers and people who are listening that don't underestimate these two things and they have to come together, your appetite and your capacity. So it's a good thing to understand what your capacity at your, how many dependents you have, uh, how many years, what kind of risk is associated to your job. I mean, if you're in the government, 99% of the times, nothing will happen to you. Are you in the hotel industry? Are you in the airline industry? You know, where do you work so that uh, your job is at risk? So all of these things blend in to give you your risk capacity. Lovely. And one <clears throat> favorite topic of yours, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> I know that is, is the whole thing around the insurance industry. Uh, every customer we come across and you they got a product called a portfolio analyzer, which you basically ingest their existing portfolio <laughs> and look at. It. And the question, and everybody will have this list of policies. I mean, uh, with due respect, and there's a, there's a picture behind me, which is my uh, dear father. Uh, as a 70 year old general, somebody sold him an insurance policy. I thought it was criminal. Uh, how do you, <laughs> what are your thoughts? I know it's a favorite topic. I just wanted to know a little bit more. It's not a favorite, it's a bugbear. It's just that. Uh, in all the policy and regulatory work that I have done, I think that is one of the failures that uh, not enough has been done to change the product so that it doesn't destroy household savings. And I just want to give one small statistic uh, that the products actually built like traps and people don't understand that they are entering these traps when it is sold because the first year commission we all know now goes to about 42%, which means on a lack of premium, the agent legally is taking away 42,000 rupees of yours. Now, if you happen to listen to me or Atul in that one year and you realize you've been sold a lemon and you don't pay the next premium, nothing comes back to you. So the insurance rules allow the company to appropriate your entire investment. So you're worrying about a 30% up and down in the stock market. You worry if you're liquid fund loses 20 basis points. But in this product, your entire money is gone if you don't pay the second premium. If you don't pay the third premium, you pay two, you, you pay two lakh, you get 60,000 back if you change your mind. You paid five premiums and you change your mind. You put five lakh and you change your mind, you get two and a half lakh back. It's a capital loss. Now you, this policy is 20 years. Till the 19th year, if you change your mind, you'll get 18 lakh or less. You still have a capital loss till the last year. In the, at the 20th year, you will suddenly make a 3% CAGR return. This is the product that you're buying. Unfortunately, no one explains it like this to you. So you look at the rebate that the agent gives you, half your commission, half your premium back. You think of a bonus. Bonus is nothing but the interest which they're calling bonus to attract you. So it's like the biggest con job in India and there's 35 trillion rupees, 35 with 12 zeros behind it of your and my money with the Indian insurance, life insurance industry, 35 trillion rupees of assets under management. So uh, it's just, it's a destruction of your money. The faster you can get out, the better it is. And uh, the scrutiny is far lower. So a small debt event in a mutual fund is, you know, it's front page news. Yeah. But because the ULIPs investing in the same paper don't declare their portfolio, don't have that kind of scrutiny, there is not even a blink about the money invested there. So it's just that there's more disclosure, so you worry more. Thanks, Monica. Thanks. That, that, that really helps. The other thing which uh, we set out to do when we began uh, Scriptbox uh, in, the, in the wealth management or mutual fund industry uh, was to prevent mis-selling. Uh, and sort of uh, what I would say, either the customers were underserved or ill-served. Uh, and obviously, God has been kind and we've done something. What is your thoughts around the current practices? Uh, because we still come across stories of, uh, I mean, a lot of regulation has changed with NFOs reducing and churn reducing. But what's your experience currently in the larger market around mis-selling or just bad selling because people don't know? Uh, they call up an uncle or they call up a friend and then you end up with something which you don't understand. Uh, what's your what's your been your experience over the last a few years on that? 
And the I current... think he has done very well, as you said, in taking that conflict out of the product. So I don't know how many of your uh, customers would remember, maybe none of them, that the NFOs used to come with a 6% front charge. And that could be amortized over five years, which meant that if a mutual fund collected 1,000 crore through an NFO, 6% of that could be booked as a marketing cost, which the investor would pay. So in the, um, you know, in the early 2000s, you had these huge rush of NFOs. Damodaran was the SEBI chief. And I do remember talking to him about it. I was in Indian Express and I said, you know what, this is happening. And he then took that 6% away on open-ended funds. The NFOs turned into closed-end funds. You know, so uh, then 2009, Mr. Bhave took away the front load, which may and means that if you invest 100 rupees in a mutual fund, 100 rupees goes to work. Remember, in an insurance policy, traditional 100 rupees you invest, uh, 38 rupees go, uh, six, uh, 58 rupees goes to work. You know, so very small amounts go to work. So 100 rupees, 100 rupees goes to work. There is one charge called expense ratio, which is charged. Then the industry began to upfront this trail. So okay. we have stopped that also. So I am seeing subconscious every year, SEBI constantly tightens the product. And I think if you, if I can take the analogy of a road traffic system that the uh, traffic lights usually bring order in the traffic, but you will always have accidents. So what does my market look like? Do most of the people complain of being missold? Or are there a few cases of mis-selling? If most of the people complained of being missold, then in March to 2020, we would not have seen the 12% increase in net inflows into mutual funds when the market had crashed the way it had crashed. So, so Indian mutual fund investors have been well advised mm -hmm. and understood that market is actually cheap, so let me buy more. Mm -hmm. My, I'm saying that, yes, there is mis-selling, but that is not industry standard anymore. So and to catch that you know, driver who's jumping the red light then becomes so much easier, rather than if there is hit and run like you see in insurance, everywhere so yes there is mis-selling but no it is not a systemic problem that's reassuring for customers and for for us as participants in the industry uh, and i'll move to a few questions which uh, people are asking so there's a question uh, for a new investor should we plan our portfolio along with our parents or should we plan it separately uh, from a financial standpoint especially when people have different belief systems about investments so this is that classical, uh, as a family or, or uh, your thoughts. Uh, from our perspective, obviously, it's depending on the asset allocation, depending on the, the financial goals and what you do, but would love to hear your thoughts on this. So in the Indian context, I'm not sure whether you mean a nuclear family or an extended family. So in a nuclear family, if it is uh, you know spouses and children, then of course it's one unit. But the minute if you are including extended family with parents and parents-in-law, then I would imagine that there are two separate plans. So the nuclear family, I mean, your, uh, the two spouses must absolutely plan it together because I know in the younger, the millennials and the Gen Z, it's your money and my money and there's very little intersection between them, which is also fine, but there have to be certain goals which are common, which need to be discussed and uh, spending patterns then also have to fall into line according to those goals. So I think uh, I would I would go for a nuclear family plan rather than a his and a her or a her her and a his his whatever the combinations are. But uh, I would also encourage people to get their parents into some kind of uh, you know order in their uh, financial lives because at some point you know, you will be responsible for them. And sometimes it's too late to undo the mistakes which you see in insurances and portfolios. So it's a good idea to do your planning and then encourage your parents and parents-in-law and whoever else in the extended family to also clean up their portfolios. 
So I'll give you an anecdote, my own. I mean, I, I have been founder of Scriptbox for a few years, uh, uh, CEO of a mutual fund company previously. Uh, my father unfortunately passed away last year, so God bless his soul. When I cleaned up his portfolio, <clears throat> he had 40 fixed deposits, right? Small amounts, uh, something for puja, something for this, and that's how they operate. And this is in spite of being my father. So he just brought home uh, the truth that how much it's so important for us to work with our parents uh, to help them do it. That's right, Atul, but that's the toughest conversation because they tend to not believe what their kids are doing, you know, in the sense it took me years and years before I could get my dad to, you know, get out of his fixed deposits and do uh, his retirement corpus into funds and do a SWP, you know, mm -hmm. just so that uh, his monthly income continues, but he has a mutual fund portfolio. But it, it took like, you know, 15 years of... Uh, just demonstrating what is possible and not pushing in too hard. But I think the family discussions are the toughest. They just don't take you seriously enough. That's true. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, yeah, just to add to what Monica said, this plan called a systematic withdrawal plan, uh, we I think it's a phenomenal thing for parents. Uh, if you can set it up well and uh, you just figure out what their monthly needs are, right. they're just comfortable. So just right. as an advice, we, we really would encourage people. And it's a tax-friendly thing. I mean, now with the dividend uh, plan, it's it's far more tax friendly than that uh, dividend distribution plan. Sure, sure. Uh, there's a question around uh, again the same classical asset allocation. Any thumb rules around equity versus debt, or so? Uh, what do you typically tell people? I mean, uh, people typically are there any rules of thumb? Age minus seventy, age minus thirty, uh, stuff like that. Well, it's your age is usually. What it is, so 100, if you're 30 years old, then 70% of your portfolio. If you're 70, you still have 30% in the market. At 80, you still have 20% in the market. But I think uh, that asset allocation question, as a rule of thumb, it's good to introduce it like this. But without the help of a planner, I don't think you can fix this. It is a technical thing. It is complicated. And that asset allocation is also looking after your short, medium, long-term goals. It's not that you're creating different little pools everywhere, you're not creating 40 FTs. It is the bucket of short-term funds, medium-term, long-term, and it is the distance from today that determines your allocation. So for a short-term goal, you will not have any equity into it. And for a long-term goal, I would have very little debt into it. So these are decisions you must work through with your advisor, planner, and understand that um, what will work for your friend or neighbor or social peer may not work for you because the two situations are different. And I love to give the food analogy here to say that your diet is particular to you and your set of either lifestyle diseases or uh, weight goals or health goals. You cannot copy anybody else's diet. Similarly, it's a very personal uh, decision because it's based on your goals your spending habits and your uh, the way that you want your future to look. Thanks, Monica. That's a very interesting question. I uh, want to know, how do I encourage my nephew just start earning to start saving and investing? Now, this is our favorite topic, so I'll hand it over to Monica. Uh, I'm very passionate about this, but would love to know your thoughts uh, about so young self. The things that uh, young people and all of us were there once is that you believe that youth is forever. Oh. And... <laughs> Don't think that you will ever, ever grow old or be in a situation where you don't have the sort of energy or the capacity to do more. I find that introducing such people to an aging app to just put your picture and see your face at 40, 50, 60, 70, 80. And to understand that, uh, you know, we are not unique as a 30 year old today. There have been 30 year olds for thousands of years. It's not something unique that you have achieved by being young today. There have been for thousands of years, you know, it's a continuum. You That whole cycle of life is there. I think it encourages people to see themselves in the future seriously. True. And then figure out that, yes, I will get there. And that's not a scary thing if I prepare for it. So sometimes it does work. I don't know what else will. I know we are, that's absolutely true. I mean, just the realization that I also will need money in the future. And 
uh, I can't spend it all. And I mean, we you try to use that the hackneyed the old power of compounding. That uh, yeah. the example we give is that somebody who's 25 invests for 10 years and stops, and somebody starts at 35 and invests till they're 60. The first person who invests for 10 years is going to be better off than the person uh, who he'll never play catch up for the next 25 years. Correct. So start early, remaining invested, and believing in the power of compounding. Like you were saying, if you've just been in the market long enough, you know you will you will make money. Yeah, and it's a growth economy. True. We we have no option but to grow. And that uh, is the other uh, the other question, which love to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, is there's this today, especially in the in the last month or so, a month and a half, there seems to be a disconnect between the economy uh, and the economic outlook and yes. what the stock markets are doing. Right, uh, stock markets are obviously held holding up very well, <clears throat> and generally the belief is that we've discounted the bad news already. But uh, would like to know your opinions on uh, where are we at today, etc. That's right. So there's global liquidity. I mean, we know rates abroad are negative. In India also, there is a whole lot of liquidity pushed into the market. And uh, which is why markets are actually going up. Because see earlier, what would happen to liquidity? A lot of it would go into real estate. But real estate, the nuclear winter began almost 10 years ago. And the nuclear winter of real estate is still got many years ahead of it. Because we are still seeing yields of one and a half, one, one and a half percent till the time that yields, which is annual rent divided by capital value of the property, reaches at least a four, you're not interested in real estate as investment. So where will this liquidity go? It's going into the markets, it's going to gold. Um, so I would imagine that there is rough weather ahead of the stock market. But again, if you've done your asset allocation well and you've not got overly exuberant about this uh, little bit of gas in the market, then you should be okay because the economy will recover. It's just going to take time. We don't know whether it's a V-shaped or a L-shaped or a W. Nobody knows because this is an event which really nobody can predict. So we don't know if there's a second wave. We don't know if there's a third wave. But we do know that we will come back out of it, whether it's in one year, two years, three years. So if you have, if you've invested in equity with the right time horizon, then the smart thing is to go on continuing with your SIPs, of course. But don't expect this to be a smooth, nicely upward sloping curve. So you'll have to belt up for hard shocks. If you're there for the long run and you don't uh, look at uh, CNBC every day and look at your uh, net worth every day, you're fine. So absolutely, absolutely beautifully put. Yeah, as I say, if, if India is gambling, I mean, there was this whole run up in all these uh, uh, trading accounts, right? Uh, there, was a, there was a big rush and I always joke, if, if gambling was legal in India, we wouldn't have had that. People would have gambled anyway rather than, than throw it away in these penny stocks. Uh, the other uh, sorry before there's uh, guys in the chat window there's a there's a small questionnaire uh, we'd really like you to fill up uh, this will help uh, Monica she's been very kind to join us uh, I'd, I'd really appreciate if people could take out a minute or two and just fill that while we're talking it's it's very easy it's a couple of questions and and, and submit that for us uh, now the <clears throat> the other question uh, which people have asked is around as much as uh, investing is a financial decision. Uh, it's also a behavioral uh, uh, view of the world. So how do you balance the two? When you say behavioral, how do you That's mean? Simple. I mean, you do get emotionally attached. So how do you uh, how do you manage your like? There are ups and downs uh, in, in, in the in, in the investing cycle. And so uh, money is not see money is not emotional about you at all. Why will you be emotional about it? Money is, it completely doesn't matter who holds money, right? Money has no emotion towards you. It doesn't love you and your neighbor any differently. So it just goes to the person who's able to manage the money well. Okay. So do you want to be the person who says, oh, I don't understand and I don't want to deal with it? So money is not going to be with you. So as we say, Lakshmi is not going to be in your house. She'll go elsewhere, somebody who can look after her better. So you should 
want one is that you should want that money to be in your house you should be able to look after that money and you should be able to have that ability to want to grow that money so it's only if you want to do these things that the next manifest action will come but if in our heads we are saying right, right. Know, right. we are nearly out of time uh, my last question uh, which is uh, a bit before wrap up there was sorry I have a bad connection, Monica, I think, or maybe... Yeah, I just missed the last one line. Sorry. Uh, I missed the last one last question, line. which I will also answer. What are your thoughts on goal-based investment? Goal-based investing. I think you already answered this. Yeah, so I think your voice cracked, but I understood that goal-based investing is a great idea. If you can uh, target, like you said, a car, a vacation, a house, that a retirement, a child's education, that's really the way to go about it because it takes your focus away from the return of my fund doing worse than your fund. Then you're focused on the goal and trying to meet it. So that's the way to go. Thank you, Monica. That one line has, has made our made our day and our life. You keep saying this, till we go blue in the face that focus on the goals and not on the returns, uh, they will take your time. Uh, I want to just say thank you. And any last words from you, Monica, sir? And anything uh, to us at Scriptbox, uh, to us, uh, to our customers, any advice us to us as uh, as the people who run Scriptbox? Uh, I think it's been a, it's been a great journey, uh, especially for the mutual fund intermediation market. And I really wish you all the luck because you came in with a new product, a new way of doing it, and uh, you know you've gone on taking it to the next level. So more power to you, and uh, you know entrepreneurs like you who've taken a business idea and then come into the market. And my only wish is that we can do the same thing in the Indian insurance industry so that uh, households money is not wasted. Coming soon. <laughs> soon. <laughs> Thank you very much for, the, for that. Uh, and on behalf of uh, all of Scriptbox and all our customers, thank you so much for taking the time out. Uh, it's been uh, our pleasure to have you here. And to all our customers and uh, people who joined us, thank you for taking uh, this time out. Uh, don't worry about money. Uh, it'll take care of itself. Uh, you've got more important things to do. So uh, leave it to the experts, as I say. So thank you once again, everybody. Uh, we'll be dialing off now. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme-related documents carefully before investing.